Hello and welcome. Today we're continuing with Unit 1.4 Network Security, looking at identifying and preventing threats. So this is what we're going to be looking at and we'll cover all of it in this video. First of all, a little bit of background. It is important for individuals and organizations to identify and prevent threats. Individuals could lose data that is private or personal, for example, credit card information or photos of friends and families. Businesses can lose data that is financially valuable and difficult or expensive to replace. Businesses can suffer a loss of reputation, which could lead to losing business. People working for organizations could lose their job over attacks if they have been careless. And don't forget, companies and individuals could be legally liable if precautions are not followed, for example, under the Data Protection Act of 2018 in the UK and similar laws in other countries. There are a number of different methods that can be used to limit threats and protect networks and computer systems from unauthorized access, including penetration testing, anti-malware software, firewalls, user access levels, passwords encryption, and physical security. Penetration testing or pen testing is attempting a controlled attack on a network to identify vulnerabilities in a network security. Testers take on the role of hackers and try to gain unauthorized access in a controlled attack. This usually involves carrying out multiple types of attack to see which is most successful. Penetration testing is done by the organization itself or an external contractor they have hired. Pen testing is used by organizations so they can find and fix vulnerabilities before hackers do. Good penetration testing will test technical vulnerabilities, the security awareness of users to see how likely they are to fall for social engineering, the effectiveness of network security policies, and the ability to recover data that has been lost or compromised following an attack. Anti-malware software is designed to detect and remove various types of malware. Sometimes referred to as antivirus software, as virus is a much more mainstream term than malware. Some people like to draw a distinction between anti-malware and antivirus software that I don't think exists. Any sort of product you buy today, whether it's marketed as anti-malware or antivirus, will do much the same thing. This protects systems in several ways. Anti-malware software monitors computer systems for suspicious activity, for example, for viruses, worms, spyware, and other malicious objects. This is called real-time protection, and it detects threats in open files and scans apps in real-time as they're installed on the device. Network-based anti-malware can perform real-time scans of network traffic to detect whether they have been infected with a virus. This software can also perform periodic scans of the whole system looking for malicious applications. If a virus or other malware is detected, it is quarantined. This prevents it from running and allows users to attempt to clean or remove the infected file. Anti-malware requires regular updates to ensure it is up to date with the latest antivirus, anti-worm, anti-trojan definitions and remain effective. Moving on, let's look at firewalls. A firewall is designed to prevent unauthorized access to a network. A firewall is designed to prevent unauthorized access to a network and can be provided by either a hardware device or a piece of software. Firewalls inspect and filter incoming and outgoing data packets to ensure that they meet the security criteria that have been configured. If the packet does not meet the security criteria, it is not allowed through. Firewalls protect a network or computer from attempt by hackers to break in from the outside. However, they also protect against attempts by malware to send data packets out of the network from infected machines. Some security criteria may include the MAC address of the computer sending the data, the type of data that has been sent or received, IP address filtering to only allow traffic from certain known sources, so this can be used to block uh, denial of service attacks. It can also be used to prevent users and programs from accessing specific internet sites. Next, we have user access levels. Users of a network are often arranged into user groups. Each group has different user access rights that determine what software, 
hardware and files they're permitted to access. For example, on a school network, staff may be able to access certain folders that pupils cannot. Common user access rights include read, write, execute, and delete permissions. User access levels are an important way of avoiding attacks caused by careless actions by users. Preventing normal users from installing new software means that malware cannot be installed, even if a user is lured into clicking on a suspicious link. If a hacker obtains a low-level employee's password, their access to the system is hopefully very limited. Access to confidential information can be limited to only those who need it, which again helps prevent against insider attacks. Passwords help to prevent unauthorized users from accessing a device or network. Passwords are one of the simplest and oldest forms of authentication. However, passwords are only effective if they remain secret and they're not easy to hack. Hackers can find out information about users, such as the dates of birth and names of family members. Such personal information should never be used for passwords because it's easy to find out. Long passwords, so at least eight or more characters, hopefully longer, that use a mixture of letter, numbers, and symbols will take longer to guess in a brute force attack. A good way of preventing a brute force attack is to lock accounts for, say, 30 seconds or another amount of time after a number of incorrect attempts. Password reset policies will force users to change their password after a certain amount of time. So, for example, every month or every couple of months or every year. This limits the damage an attacker can do if they guess or obtain a password. Two-factor authentication, 2FA, can be used to add an extra layer of security to the use of passwords. In addition to providing a username and password, the user has to enter a code that only they have access to. Usually this code has been sent to another device, such as a mobile phone or an email address. Passwords are gradually being replaced or enhanced with what we call biometric authentication. So for example, a fingerprint reader or facial recognition. Biometric factors are often used as the second step in two-factor authentication. So you enter your username and password, and then you have to enter a fingerprint, for example, to confirm who you are. This makes it a lot more difficult for hackers to force access. Next up, encryption. Encrypting data means scrambling plain text data in such a way that it cannot be read by unauthorized persons, even if they manage to access the data. Encrypted data requires the correct key to be used in order to be decrypted. Keys are made up of very large numbers, for example 128 or 256 bit, that are near impossible to brute force. Wi-Fi networks should use secure encryption, for example WAP2 or WPA3, to ensure that network packets cannot be intercepted and read. Files on a network or removable storage device can also be encrypted, so they cannot be read if somebody manages to gain access to them. So even if your network is hacked, the data that is stolen should be worthless because unauthorized people cannot read it. It's also important not to forget about physical security. This is about protecting hardware, software, networks, and data from physical actions that could cause harm. This could include burglary and theft, but also help prevent against things like damage from fire, floods, and natural disasters. Security measures might include keeping servers in a locked room that can only be accessed by network managers and ensuring that backups are kept off-site in a different secure location. Other security measures could include locking doors, locking windows, intruder alarm systems, CCTV, laptop locks, for example, Kensington, or posting security guards. And finally, we're just going to mention a little bit about network policies. A network policy is a document that sets out the rules and procedures to help protect a network. Businesses, schools, and universities will typically have these. This will include an acceptable use policy, a contract that each person signs before they're given access to the network. It covers how they're expected to use the network and how they're supposed to behave. The acceptable use policy might include how to choose a secure password, how often passwords should be changed, how to keep passwords safe, making sure people know they should log off workstations when leaving it, not installing any software or downloading prohibited files, 
perhaps not using USB memory sticks without prior permission. On the next couple of slides, I'm just going to cover a lot of the threats that we've looked at and ways that we could prevent against them. Starting with malware. Obviously, we can install various types of anti-malware or antivirus software. We can ensure that operating systems are kept up to date. We could implement user access levels to prevent standard users from being able to install software. Make sure people only download programs from trusted websites and educate users about the risks of opening emails and attachments from unknown sources. That brings us on to social engineering. Again, education is very important. Make sure the users of a network are aware of the tactics of criminals and can guard against them. We have to ensure that network and security policies are followed. For brute force attacks, using long passwords that include special characters can help. We can use complex pass phrases instead of single words. We can use password manager software. Networks and websites can limit the number of login attempts allowed. And networks and websites can use two-factor authentication. Denial of service attacks and distributed denial of service attacks. We can install a firewall to reject packets that originate from the same source or have identical contents. And we can configure a firewall to restrict the number of packets that can be accepted from a, in a particular time frame, SQL injection. We can use input validation to set passwords and username rules that don't permit characters which can be used in SQL injection attacks. We can use input sanitization to remove special characters and SQL command words from the input before processing it. To help prevent against data interception and theft, we can use strong encryption, especially on Wi-Fi networks. We can use MAC address authentication on networks so that only known devices can connect. And we can ensure that websites are using HTTPS connections so that if data is intercepted, it cannot be read. In summary, there are many ways we can detect to prevent vulnerabilities in networks. Pen testing is a controlled attack on a network to identify vulnerabilities in a network security. Anti-malware or antivirus software is designed to detect and remove malware. Firewalls monitor packets going into and out from a network. User access levels control what access users have to a system. Passwords and biometrics and two-factor authentication can help authenticate users. Physical security guards against theft, fire, and flood. And encryption can stop unauthorized users reading and make use of data if they should get access to it. Well, I hope that was useful to you. I'll be back with more videos in the future. Good luck in the future with your studies.